as we sit in a country that is loaded with witchcraft, magic, occultic people everywhere, and that's in Mexico, I want to say this is also applicable to us in the United States and in most of the world. So today's message is going to be a series, but I'm going to call it Under the Influence. Now, we can always remember somebody telling us, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. You're making a bigger deal out of it than what it really is. You know, what's your problem here? Lighten up. Come on. You guys just really make devils behind every bush. Well, when I first came to the Lord in 1969, it was not as prevalent as it is today. Today, worship of demons and witchcraft and any sort of favor or favor, flavor, whatever you want to call it, is practiced everywhere without us even knowing. Now, I went and took and looked some words up that I felt would be important. So let's look at the word rebellion. Rebellion means a violent action organized by a group of people who are trying to change the political system in their country. It can be in the government and it can be over those who are rulers. And the next word I want you to pay attention to is beguile. Beguile is to persuade, attract, or interest someone and sometimes in order to deceive him or her. The reason that we fight our carnal spirit so much in this world is because we are not convinced that God is in control of our lives. We're not convinced that we have submitted to him. When I go back to the story of Eve, it's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. And I'm just going to kind of break it down because someone was kind enough to break it down for us. It says, when the devil tempted Eve in the garden, he stirred up the sinful nature. Now, I want you to remember it was God who told Adam not to eat of the fruit. According to text, he did not tell Eve. Now, right there is your first indication about the man not being the spiritual head of his household. Because if he set the spiritual set, um, standard for the household, there would not be re rebellion. There would not be all kinds of witchcraft that's happening in that family. So we have Adam, who is the head of the household, who does not set the standard. So that tells me that man will always have a tendency to give in to the devices of this world. If you're to be the spiritual priest of your household, then you must do what you're required to do according to God, which is to pray and live a godly life. Now, I'm not going into the spiritual priesthood right now of the parent or the husband. So in verses 1, he questioned God's word. He did not deny that God had spoken. He simply questioned whether God had really said that, what Eve thought he said. The first thing we say is, oh, I don't really believe that God said that. Now, when you think about the first original sin, it all started in rebellion. Rebellion. So your pastor gets up and tells you, watch your conversation. Don't be talking vile. Don't be talking ungodly. Watch your actions. Make sure you reflect what is of God because what you're doing to do opposite of that is the spirit of rebellion. And according to that first few verses in the third chapter of Genesis, Eve was beguiled. She was enticed. She was reasoning, oh, it's not going to happen that way. It won't go that way. What do you mean? We better watch what we put in our brain before we become that. If you're built on hostility and anger and you're always wanting to fight, you better watch that spirit because that's not always of God. It's something inside of you that's trying to destroy you. There's a time and a place to stand up. And not every day is a time and place. So we see that Eve gives in to this, this uh, the beguiling, the temptation and reasoning. Oh, you know, I can't see where that fruit would cause me one bit of problem. I don't know what, I don't know why they're looking at it that way. You go out there in the world, you know, a little sip of alcohol, that's not going to cause me a problem. There's a reason they call it spirits, by the way, because it does have the spirit of hell behind it. Oh, you know, a little took off of a marijuana cigarette, that's not going to bother me. But it will, it will destroy you because that sin of rebellion is everything that is against God. So when you're not doing what God wants you to do, you're in a spirit of rebellion. When we go on to the next portions, we see that uh, 
The way Satan asked the question implies that he was questioning God. If God really loved you, how many times have we said that? If God really loved me, he wouldn't let this happen. And it goes on, he wouldn't keep something from you, would he? So he was using this power of reasoning. Well, if he really loved you, he's not going to let this happen. Just because the minute we take part of the sin, we're not immediately off the world, is the mercies of God. That if we continue in that mentality, number one, God will never bless the house. Our conversation and our lives, according to scripture, must be pure. Now, if you remember, and I'm going to bring this back to you because I'm talking to you about devils working in your life. If you remember in the tabernacle where God's presence was, the people were not allowed to be in the congregation. They had to be on the outside of the temple, but they could gather around the walls. And when that high priest went in to give that sacrifice, and if that high priest had sin in his life, he was immediately smote down dead and pulled out of there by a rope. He had a rope around his ankle. And as long as they could hear that bell tingling, they knew that the priest was still in there. But the minute it stopped, they knew that God had smit him down dead. God does not want sin in our lives because it destroys us. And we let our spirit, the nature of man, and in this time and age, this, the God within you, run against God's word. So when God says, let your conversation be chaste and let it be pure and let it be things that lift up God and we do the opposite, who are we honoring? The man in the Bible that was called Satan, spirit Satan. We want God to take our lives and we want him to be pleased with them. So as that high priest went into there, as long as that life was pure, God heard and received the sacrifice. Now what's happened in today's world, we have multiple preachers who do not even live the life because they have gotten caught up in the money and the fame and the prestige. They want to be somebody. So what Satan did to the church world is he sent in, as I've taught before, change agents, spirits of hell that came through a charismatic individual. Not everybody who's charismatic and they catch people's attention is of God. You better watch that spirit. So they bring in these charismatics and then they start making way through leadership. And if the leader is not strong because they have a hidden sin, then that demon comes in and controls that church and the spirit of God is gone. This is what's happened to the Christian world. And the Christians will not stand up against that demonic preacher and go start another church. We're always taught in Pentecost, you know, don't cause a schism, don't cause a, a, a division in the church. The reason they said that is the same as they said in the Catholic church, because they knew if people got the truth, they'd leave. That there's a bunch of cowards calling themselves Christians. So we're under the influence of somebody at all times. I prefer to be under the influence of God and not under the influence of this life. So when Satan comes in here and says, you will surely, he says, you will surely die. So all of us are going, well, I haven't died yet. Nothing's happened to me. There is a natural death and a spiritual death. Your spiritual death will happen instantaneously. You won't notice it because you're being beguiled into believing nothing's wrong with it. Nothing's wrong with that. You go over to some little card reader. Oh, we're just going to find out what the future is. In a few minutes, excuse me, I'm not going to read all 30 something scriptures, but I'm going to prove to you scripturally Old Testament and New Testament within the next few classes that to be a part of those immediately separates you from God. And then we have to fight our way back. I don't know if any of you have ever been out in the Gulf or the ocean and tried to ride the waves. I, I used to love to do that when we lived in Houston area in Galveston. I'd go out to a certain depth and then I'd jump over the waves. Sometimes you'd get kind of tired and if you lost your footing, that wave would be pulling you out. There was no way you could fight your way back. When sin gets a hold of you under the undertow of the current, you have to fight your way back. Otherwise, you brought out to sea where you are eventually destroyed and it doesn't take long. When we open ourselves up to be careless in our personal lives, we're opening ourselves up for Satan to take complete control and pull us out into the depth. So we die a spiritual death almost instantaneously. 
Now, when we ask God to forgive us, and he will, you can't make that your calling card. I'm going to sin right now, and I'm going to ask God to forgive me, and he's going to forgive me, and I can go on and do it. And it doesn't work that way. That's when you're tempting God. You're saying, you know, if I do this, it's going to be all right. You know, it's not going to matter. But Satan comes and tells him, you know, you think he's told you this, but did he tell you the truth? When we talk about the holidays based on paganism and the problems associated with that, people look around and go, well, everybody else is doing it. When I start giving you the scriptures, it's going to tell you that America and other worlds that got involved in this are completely under the influence of hell, completely. What you don't realize is that power is stronger than you. And you better watch who you hang out with. You better watch what you do because they will drag you down like a weight. I've been in, uh, I've told this story before. When I was a young child, we lived in a place called Largo Canyon. And it was out about 50 miles from the nearest town. And I remember to get to town, you had to cross this dry riverbed. By the natural eye, it did not look like there was a problem. It just, you know, it was just a dry riverbed and the trucks went across it generally without a problem. But if it rained up north, the flooding of that riverbed could happen within seconds. Well, my dad and mom were going to town. We only went once a month because that's all we could afford to go. And it was such a long drive anyway. And we started across what dad thought was just a small trickle of water, maybe, you know, 12 inches, if that. But by the time we got midway, that dam broke. And all of a sudden, the wall of water came rushing in. And I looked in the floorboard, and there was water inside the floorboard. And my dad hollered, get up in the seats. So the three of us jumped up in the, the seat, standing up. That's how small we were. And that water was coming faster than my dad could keep up with it. He had pulled a jack out of the back of the trunk of the car and he ran around and was trying to jack it up every wheel to keep us three kids from being killed. He knew he was fighting against hope. So my mother was terrified of water. So my dad carried her over to the shore and my mom went to go find help. And my dad did not stop working to keep us alive. My dad could have said, you know, let the kids go. Leona and I are fine, but he didn't. Tiringly, he pumped that, goes to the next tire, and he does it again, and we're sitting there watching the water rise up in the car. You can't imagine the fear that gripped the three of our hearts, but there was a sense of daddy's got it under control. Now, I'm going to put this in a spiritual level. Your spirit goes under fast, but God in heaven is trying to keep you afloat to get your attention. (coughs) If you don't think that got me and my brother's attention, you're crazy. But what really got our attention is when we looked out the front window of the car, not just watching daddy go around, and we saw mama with an old rancher and a tractor, and here came our help. When we thought we were going to go under, we wouldn't survive this. Here comes our help. When you don't think that you're going to survive this, you better look ahead and know that God will send the help. You just got to be aware of that. And you need to be able to hang a hold of that's something that God's sending to you. Had that rancher and my mother not got there. You see, mama was getting there. Daddy was trying to do his thing. But us three kids were soon pulled out of that water and we were in safety. Now, let me tell you something. Your trial, your test testing is only for a season. Because if you trust in God and you give him your life, he will always see you through. He will pull you out. Scripture tells me there's no temptation that is made that he will not give you the strength to overcome that temptation. But you're too busy rebelling against God to hang on to God. You can't serve two masters. So here Eve is tempted. And then she's told, but it was pleasant. It looks like a good plan. I want to go out and eat with somebody. They get out there, they start drinking, and you kind of stay in there versus saying, you know, I really need to go right now. I am very quick, and there's been people here in this country in the last couple of months that invited me out to eat. And they sit down, they order their alcohol, and they'll ask me, do you 
care for some or whatever. And I said, I don't drink. I make it known, I don't drink. Because I do not drink and I don't intend to drink. They can pour their bottle all they want. But while they're pouring their bottle, I'm talking to them about God. Is that not right? Because I hope you'll feel convicted that you gave your life over to a bottle instead of to the Lord. That's a pretty empty vessel, isn't it? When you let God fill your vessel with his love and his kindness and what he wants in your life, you've got to understand he makes changes. Your wife's went to watch service. I told her that later because she's in a different country. Okay. Um, so it was pleasant to the eye, but they said, oh, but it'll taste good. You know, they make some foods down here in this country, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, with alcohol and with blood. And I want to make sure that I'm not eating blood since the scripture definitely speaks against it. So when I go out to eat, I make sure it's a place that I'm comfortable with and I'm aware of what they're cooking. So when we get under the influence, let's explain something here. The influence, first and primarily, will be your family. Those are the first ones to belittle you, degrade you, make you feel worthless, make you feel stupid for following God. They're the first ones. And yet they're also a mighty instrument used of the devil to destroy you. We in this world think that we have to just be compliant and don't make anybody mad. If you serve God, you're going to tick the devil off. You're going to blow up the reins because he's not going to be happy with it. You know, when I was in service the other night and we were worshiping God, and then I don't know that any of you saw what I was doing. But while I was worshiping God, I was rebuking and sending the powers of hell away from there. And I was doing this while I was worshiping. And the next thing I know, I'm seeing people gathering right outside the door of the, of the school. And that's where we're having churches at the school. And I opened my eyes and they just stood there. And I thought, what's got the church bound is they don't have the power of God because they don't walk with him. God will not honor a preacher or a leader who does not walk with him. And any minister should have the power of the Holy Ghost to bring him into the place he's reaching out to people. And when I first started my first sermon when I was 16, of all things, I preached on prayer and fasting because I'd done three days of it. I was going to preach my first sermon on a Wednesday night Bible study. And I didn't have a clue. I was such a nervous person, did not like to speak in the public. And oh, I didn't like everybody focused at me. And yet my pastor was putting me to the test. He didn't believe in women preachers. So he made the statement before I took the pulpit that God doesn't call women to preach. Guess they're in trouble, aren't they? And so he said, uh, we've got a young woman here. We're going to prove that God hasn't called her to preach. Why don't you come on up to the pulpit, Sherry, and give us what you got. Now, I am like so nervous that I tell the congregation, God gave you nine fingers and two thumbs. <laughs> I am that nervous. And all of a sudden, the guy that liked me and brought me to church, he starts holding up his fingers. And, and I'm thinking, I think I just messed up on that one. But instead of focusing on my mess up, I began to teach and preach what God had given me. And I will never forget what words I couldn't say from my mouth because of my timidness and shyness. God took over and began to deliver the message out of my heart. And when I was finished, people began to run to the altar and he said, give me that paper. If there was ever a woman that was called of God, she is. And he signed it in front of the congregation. Wow. Wow. That wasn't me. I couldn't take a sentence and put it together straight. I get all these notes that I research and I study a lot. My son can verify that. But whether I'm going to get to all of this or not is iffy. If God deems me to give it, I will. I think the most important thing that you need to understand right now is who is your influence? What is your influence? If your conversation is never about God, he's not in the picture. When your, God, your conversation is about God and his goodness and what he does and, and so forth, he is ever present in your situation. 
You can't pick God up and put him down. Pick him up and put him down. He's not a a tinker toy. He's assembling your life. You don't assemble his. In the Bible, the reason people don't read it, they say they don't understand it. That's really not the problem. In our country, we have been conditioned not to read, and we find nothing interesting in it. Because my boys were young and I knew they couldn't understand the Bible, I got them a picture Bible. And I'll never forget when Chris was probably about 10, 11 years old. We were living in the back of a church. And he'd say to me, Mom, Mama, I I read my Bible. I said, good, son, that's great. You know, how far did you get? He goes, no, I read the whole thing. I, I just bought you this book. He read this book so many times that he could flip open the book and say, right here, Mama, is the story about such and such and such and such and such. And he was spot on. He knew it. If I ask you the story that happened in the book of Exodus, or you could tell about the Exodus with Moses, but what other stories could you tell me about? That's a guideline to our lives. It's a pattern to our lives. So we need to realize that we either fit in God's mold or we feel fit into Satan's. So it says the first reason with the fact it was good for good food. And as I've disclaimed several times or claimed, it was not an apple. When I did research, research years ago, it was said that apples don't grow in the Mesopotamia Valley. And the Mesopotamia Valley is approximately where the Garden of Eden was. So that fruit doesn't grow there. But somebody came along and said, you know, it's an apple. And everybody believed it. See how easy we took someone's word and never read it for ourselves. When Eve was standing there, Satan says, God doesn't want you to be wise. And if you eat of this fruit, you'll have knowledge. Think what we could do without some of this knowledge. How much more peace we'd have without some of this knowledge. And she's thinking and she's reasoning and now she's under the influence of the conversation. You see, you become under the influence of the conversation when you begin to listen to the world. The world programs you, conditions you. Music does that. All forms of media does that. But what is going to influence you to do what's right is the word of God. (coughs) As the story goes, and we all know this, that she made a choice. Every day you wake up, you have a choice. Every single moment of the day, you have a choice. And that is to serve God or to serve yourself. If you're serving yourself, you're under the influence of the devil. I would think that if I wasn't promoting people to serve the Lord and live for God through my conversation in my life, then my life is in vain. Now, rebellion, I did a definition. I read it to you earlier. 1 Samuel 15 and 23. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as is iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he also rejected thee from being king. This is 1 Samuel 15, 23. Where did I say the sin started? In rebellion that Eve acted upon. And what do we see in Samuel? He's telling it's like witchcraft. When I say for you to do something that has to do with the ministry and you don't do it, that is rebellion. It's not, I forgot. It's just rebellion. You didn't want to. When I go to 2 Chronicles 33 and 6, and he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Heman. Also, he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizard. He wrought such evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. When you take part in anything that is paganistic, whether you want to call it witchcraft, paganism, or whatever, you are actually invoking those spirits into your home, and then God turns his head against you. You have to be careful even what you wear. You know, um, there are some articles of clothing that I just will not wear anymore because of the symbol- symbology that's on them. I don't want to reflect that that's what I believe in because it's not. 
And that's what a t-shirt does. It promotes things. Exodus 7, 11, and 12. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they also did all manner of their enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and it became servants, serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up theirs. There is power in witchcraft. The magic that is done and taught to children in early ages is to condition them for acceptance. I read something recently that there was, I don't know if it's still on or not, but there's a TV program I think called Lucifer. And I don't know what it's about, but I believe it's uh, promoting everything that's sinful. I, I've just seen pictures. And I'm pretty sure it doesn't have anything to do with anything good. Why would anybody want to call it Lucifer? But we have a tendency that when we're small, we don't think anything about magic. You know, we as kids, my, my uncle used to take a coin and pretend like he was rubbing it through his elbow and it coming out my ear. And I was fascinated at that. He could do that so slick. I don't even know how he did it. I think one time he told me they actually put it between his fingers and then acted like he did this. But I would think, wow, that's cool. I want to learn how to do it. Or when we'd see somebody pull, you know, a rabbit out of a hat or handkerchiefs out of a hat continuously or out of the sleeve, we'd get, we'd get curious. How do they do that? Now, there is a level of that that does use demonic spirits. And some of these people, like David Copperfield, it's not just illusion by mirror. It's a lifestyle to them that is honoring Satan. There was a house bill, and I want to say it was House Bill 624. Uh, I might have to look that back up. If I'm wrong, then I'll clarify it. Matter of fact, look it up, please. House Bill 624 promoted witchcraft and occultism. And it was put out by Pete Sessions. That was who drafted that. And it was done by a Texas Republican. Now, these people are promoting witchcraft in schools. It's enough, not enough that the teachers don't live right, but now we've got to submit ourselves to this mess. When you have to sit under a homosexual as a teacher, get your kid out of that school. If Lot wasn't allowed to stay into Sodom and Gomorrah, why is your child, your child allowed to stay in a public school where this is promoted, where transgender is promoted? Why are they allowed to do that? That means you have no conviction because if you had a conviction, the minute you found out your school allowed that was the minute you'd pull your child out of it. If you had to homeschool or find a private school, whatever you had to do, you would pull them out of these things. When sports gets to where they have transvestites and transgenders and opposite sexes in this sports, why is our child in sports anyway? I remember when my husband, my first husband was alive when our boys were born Every mother thinks their kids got to go pay, play sports, that that's the normal boy thing. When I brought it up to Robbie, Robbie said, my sons will never play sports. He was very, I mean, determined, my boys will never play sports. And I thought, wow, he is not cutting slack on that. And later he told me where I first got my first hit of drugs was when I was playing football and they needed me to continue as quarterback and they just pulled me over to the side and put me full of drugs and put me back out in the field. I won't have my boys go down that road. As I sit here and think about that, how many of you men and you women sit around these people who are running around in skimpy clothes, cheering on a pig's ball, for what purpose as a bunch of idiots? You wouldn't find those same people in church cheering them for God that you'll find them drinking their beer and doing tailgates and all of this. I said, we're under the influence. I have never found any reasoning about chasing a football. It has never made sense to me how a two hour game could become a six hour game. I thought either they don't know how to play the game or they sure are racking in a lot of money for play replay. And I hate it whenever you're listening to something and they're gonna repeat what you just saw. Yes, thank you, Tammy, over and over and over until it's like now the 10 minutes have been programmed to what they said you saw, which isn't what you saw. Now you believe you saw it. Did you see that touchdown with so-and-so? I've never understood it. 
And the women, when I was growing up, did not like sports. Now you see them watching because they like the tight pants the guys got on in that football game. Thank you. Did I give that number? Okay, the HR 642 is the bill. I think I said 624. But 642 is the bill where it promotes witchcraft in our country. And one of the main people that benefited from it was David Copperfield. Look it up. HR 642. Right, Stacy? Yes. Now let's look at this. Um, I'm going to bring this up. I love fortune cookies, but not because of the fortune. I like the fact they're not sweet. So I'll go out to eat, and they'll may provide a fortune cookie at the end. And I don't read my fortune. I don't read the piece of paper. I eat the cookie. That's because they're not very sweet. And I look around at the table that I'm sitting at, and almost everybody at that table is reading that fortune cookie. And I pastor most of them. Now tell me if that would not be disturbing. So maybe I haven't preached enough against fortune cookie reading. Now that this would be a permanent record on YouTube, you can watch it constantly. No fortune cookie reading. Uh, but we do things inadvertently. When people sit down and play cards, used to, we would not allow card playing in the church because of its association with witchcraft and reading futures. Now you have the elders of the church sitting down playing cards. They can't get into a prayer meeting and talk to God and teach a Bible study, but boy, we're going to sit there for hours and play cards. You see, things have changed and shifted dramatically. We have set ourselves in the hands of Satan and then demanding God to move and build the church. He won't do it. I don't know if I read this scripture, but I, I'm going to read it again if I did. Exodus 8, 16 through 19. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with a rod and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice in men and in beasts. All the dust of the land became lice throughout the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there, was, there were lice upon men, upon beasts. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened unto them as the Lord had said. Every time God moves in your life, your supposed loved one is going to be there to take that out from your victory, your blessing. They're going to do that. If a person declares that they serve God, their life needs to reflect it. What if you were driving down the road, like what happened to me, and there was a young man who was on a motorcycle. We were driving in the white van, headed back to town. We were here in Mexico. And I had been diagnosed with cancer, so I was having a lot of physical problems, but I didn't let that stop me. And I looked ahead of us, and there was a young man on a motorcycle, and two dogs ran out in front of him, causing the motorcycle to flip over while he was on it, sliding him a number of feet ahead of him. I told him to pull the car over when the minute I saw those dogs run over there, and he flipped. And I got out of that van in a condition of extreme pain, and I ran over to the young boy, our young man, and when I put my hand on him, you could tell he was dead. I knew that there was others who saw it, but my mind was on that boy, because I know he didn't know God. Wouldn't it be amazing if somewhere down the, in this ministry we're doing, we run into that guy? I put my hands on him, and I began to pray and speak in tongues. The next thing happened, the boy sat up and shook his head like, what just happened here? And I told him he was going to be okay. I heard the ambulance coming. I heard the people coming. And I walked away from the scene. 
I didn't know his name, but I know he was going to die without God. And I wanted to reach out to him. What if I'd been some of you in your carnal state? That boy would be dead today. But you see, my heart reached out and my actions followed. I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm saying you all are leave, living beneath what God wants to do in your life because of your doubt and your lack of consistency in your lifestyle. I serve God every day of my life, 24-7. I don't go one day that I don't serve Him and honor Him. That is just the way I feel about God. In Exodus 22 and 18, it says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So you're in the midst of Halloween where people are all dressed up like witches and demons and everything that's ungodly. And it's also a high holiday for witchcraft, for Satan. And yet you walk through those streets, you parade through your stores, you parade through your office buildings dressed up to honor the demons. And then you wonder why your life is in turmoil. If Exodus 22, 18 says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, how many know that's judgment against the witch? I'm going to read this last couple before closing this first section. Leviticus 19 and 26. Ye shall not eat anything with blood, neither shall ye use enchantment or observe times. There are certain countries where they kill the animal and pull out the entrails and read what's going to happen. We don't eat blood, therefore we don't eat pig, because the blood in the pig never is cooked out. It's considered an unclean food because it's a scavenger of the land. How many of your churches are going to stand up and tell you don't eat pig? Don't have anything to do with pork. And if you're going to eat a hot dog, make sure it's not done out of pork skins. They won't tell you that because you see they do it themselves. They have their crab boils and they have their shrimp feasts and all these things that God is written against. It's no wonder that our country has become obese. It's no wonder that we're in the health condition we are because we do not serve God like we should as a nation. It says, don't eat anything with blood. Leviticus 20 and 6. And the soul that turneth such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and cut him off from among his people. Let me give you a real clear translation. If you're not influencing people to do what's right before God, God is against you. At some point in time, God becomes more important than your fun and games. So if you have not made the all-out life change, you need to. Because he's telling you, I'll cut you off. So let's say that uh, an individual is, not, is being a hypocrite not doing what they should do. Where do you think they place in God? They're not a part of Him. I said I will never forbid anyone to come to church as long as they want to live right. But if you violate the, the Ten Commandments in such a way that you give me no option, I have to say, don't come back to this church. Recently we had that happen. A member of my church stole from a uh, local uh, business owner he caught her on tape and there was no option but to tell her to get out of here because they were going to arrest her and put her in jail. In this country, you don't want to go to jail for anything, especially stealing from a man who owns a business. I was extremely upset about the situation and I said, how can you do that? How can you take the food out of another man's mouth or his family's mouth? It violated the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal. I set that person out the door and I would not have nothing else to do with them. Because I'd made several times a statement, if you don't honor the Ten Commandments, I will not have anything to do with you. There'd been warning after warning after warning. And I'm going to go a step further. You still going to church on Sunday? How dare you spit in the face of God? And then ask God to bless you? How dare you? God is not a hypocrite, by the way. God is all sovereign. He is all the ruler we need. So we don't pick up and say, I go on Saturday and Sunday. You either obey the word of God or you don't. And that's one of the commandments, to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. 
So it isn't a mystery. It's very well laid out. You don't have to guess what that says. We pick these commandments up and we throw away. We pick what we want, we get, discard the other. We're going to learn how to stand for God and serve Him. And this is just the first of the series. Don't be under the influence of Satan. We think of being under the influence of just drugs and alcohol and crazy lifestyle. But when you are not honoring God, you are under the influence of Satan. And if you think God's going to come in and change your life with you being under his, Satan's influence, the answer is no. When you are under the influence of God and he, you become that part that he wants you to be on this earth, then it's amazing what he will do for you. You say, well, pastor, we've asked you to pray for things and it hasn't happened. That's not my fault. What's your life doing? What, how are you living? Yeah, but you don't, you know, I was just weak for a moment. Well, if you were weak for a moment, you better go and fast for longer. Because that weakness for a moment will destroy you. We are not going to serve hell in this church. We're going to uphold his gospel, the Lord's gospel. Make sure that's understood. We're going to uphold the gospel, which is the good news of God, and serve him. I would strongly suggest that you take a reevaluation of what goes on in your brain and ask yourself, what are you influenced by? I hope you learned something today, and we're going to continue on this journey of finding out about witchcraft. Again, 99.9% .9 of the churches allowed people to come in and change what they used to preach. It's, it's appalling. When I see these women up on these platforms with these skin tight, I guess they're called skinny jeans or leggings or yoga what? Pants. Yoga pants, yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's yoga pants. Yoga pants. And they're up there singing and I'm thinking, do you not realize what you're doing to the men in this congregation by you throwing and flaunting yourself out? Let's serve God every day, every hour for the rest of our lives. Now, as I always say, Enjoy the Sabbath. Go take on the day, as my son would say. <laughs>